All right. Uh, well, welcoming back everyone to this session, and I guess potentially this could be the only STEAM focused session in the symposium. So I'm very excited to uh, introduce the uh, session on modeling the complex world with generative AI and large language models. So um, on, on this exciting session on modeling the complex world, the uh, Gen AI and LM, I, I guess, uh, well, we're here now, uh, seven months after the release of ChatGPT, uh, that really opened a can of worm, and everyone's just jumped right, right on it. And, uh, uh, and we, have, um, we have not only seen the impact on you know, how it actually influenced uh, the way we interact with AI, um, we see people on the street, we, that's becoming a topic of conversation, but now uh, in this session very, we actually very much would like to bring it ev even beyond uh, the theme of the symposium on news and media, but you know, how is Gen AI and an LLM have been used beyond, uh, uh, you know, interacting with uh, uh, digital information uh, and things like that. So uh, in this session we'll, we'll see uh, the proliferation of Gen AI and LM in the, uh, the art space, in, um, in the use of, of it for modeling the physical world, the digital twins, for predictive analytics, for even a disaster response. So I think it'll be a very exciting session um, and I'm glad to be joined uh, by um, uh, the fellow uh, panelists here who are, who are all experts in their field. And I'll introduce each of them as the, uh, before um, uh, the talk, but um, I actually uh, asked them to present in reflection of these two questions. So uh, the first question I asked them to answer is uh, what, what are the most exciting directions in your own research um, in terms of the current directions and also the possible futures that we could do with um, AI and NLM um, through um, you know, their own research and also beyond. And the second thing I actually asked them to reflect on is uh, what are some practical actions we could do to ensure responsible adoption of this technology? So uh, we have uh, three speakers online uh, and we have two speakers here in person. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Bennett. So Thomas is actually a director of uh, strategic researcher engagement for APAC and EMEA at NVIDIA Corporation. His team at NVIDIA built active collaborations with top researchers and premier research institutions um, with on the scale of the world's most challenging scientific problems. Thomas is also a young professor at UQ, a young professor at UNSW, and also visiting scientist at Cyro Data 61. So, if he's actually not traveling in the Bay Area, he's actually going to be here, but unfortunately we can't get him mm -hmm. in person today. So, hi Thomas. Um, hey, hey Flora, how are you? Hello everyone. Share your screen. Let me just share the screen. Can you see me? At all? On the screen, Can you no, hear? I'll take your photo very soon. Okay, fantastic. And just take a bit of testing oh sharing the screen let's see whether that works let me know whether you can see my screen i'm sorry i couldn't be face to face i would love to be face to face with everyone uh, but that is how it is so uh, i'm broadcasting from santa clara california so can i start please thomas go ahead okay excellent yeah, so I wanted to do like a bit of like uh, stuff, uh, talk about the Gen AI, but as well, like, which is link of my passion, which perhaps some of you, if you know me, you know, like I'm very passionate about GD graphics and so on. We're going to talk a bit how uh, large language models, for instance, are connecting with computer graphics. And of course, Flora already mentioned, she asked these wonderful questions uh, that are uh, basically like driving the content of this presentation. So exciting directions. But before I go there, I wanted to give you a bit like overview uh, of what GI, uh, Gen AI is and perhaps where it fits into AI context, just for, especially for those who are not, uh, you know, like very technical. So I wanted to make this presentations like very light and, and hopefully we can have uh, a bit of discussions later on as well. So if you, if you consider different types of AI applications that uh, we uh, kind of classify them into three fundamental categories. 
So the first one is perception models. Uh, those perceptions models are basically designed to uh, help us to understand the world. Uh, so like uh, functions like detecting, classifying, and segmenting different components in existing data sets. Uh, those kind of models are uh, using uh, mainly, you know, supervised machine learning, and it could be example like in here conveyor belt and detect different elements on the conveyor belt and automate the processes. Uh, we have as well simulation models. Uh, those are very fascinating, actually. They can, for instance, accelerate physics, collisions, combustions, simulate fluids for you, uh, do hair simulations, cloth, and so on. But as well, uh, we're using uh, simulation models as well for accelerating path tracing, which is basically reinvented uh, lately the real-time computer graphics on steroids, so everything works even faster, and you can have ray tracing and real-time on our RTX cores and video GPUs. We have as well generative models, uh, so to understand the structure and context within the reference data, and then create new things. Uh, that are consistent with the structure and the context that we want to have these generations going on. And those models are using mostly unsupervised and semi-supervised machine learning components. Uh, and if you look at what uh, Gartner uh, was predicting, you, Gartner is predicting by 2025, generative AI will be producing 10% of all data we have currently on the market, uh, which, is, which is wow, right? Uh, 2022, it was just a bit less than 1%, so much, much smaller. So, you know, you're seeing where we're going, and of course, chat GPT and accelerations of uh, generative AI this year and uh, coming years, it's going to only accelerate. So when, J when J Gen AI sits within the AI context, uh, so as you can see in here, generative AI is type of artificial intelligence that uses machine learning algorithms to learn patterns and trends uh, from training data and apply uh, then with awareness to context uh, to predictively create new content that mimics uh, what would humans generate otherwise, right? So something like ChatGPT, if you had interactions with that, you would say it's almost kind of like talking to another person. And generative AI is capable of problem solving and generating new realistic content from existing content. So it could be images, text, audio, video, and so on. I'm going to show you examples of that. And useful training data for generative AI contains structure. So, for instance, uh, uh, it can be pictures of faces and uh, can be recognized because of the structure of the faces, right? That's how computer vision works. And with Gen AI and AI app applications, then that's how that basically fits into the whole algorithms, right? So, generative AI aims to find the structure and data and then create, use that structure to create new content and make sense. That makes sense. Uh, so it can be applied to many types of kinds of data. That's why everything with Gen AI Express is getting so excited because it can be applied to images, it can be applied to videos, to 3D models, and as well to language, which is especially interesting because uh, for any problems that we ask AI, it can actually talk to us in the language we understand. So no equations, no kind of you know uh, data in forms of numbers, but you know like text, right? Uh, and I assume everybody tried ChatGPT, and basically, like, if you look at the problem-solving capabilities of Gen AI, uh, so it's very, very exciting, and perhaps it's the closest thing we've seen, perhaps, to something we call general artificial, artificial intelligence, and I assume we're going to talk about this a bit later on uh, during the panel. So the large language models uh, and foundation models uh, powering the advances of generative AI uh, are very significant this, this year, especially this year is like uh, even in our companies, like when we uh, have meetings, you know, like uh, talking about the evolutions of GM AI and new algorithms, like what we were discussing a week ago is already ancient history. So you can see how quickly this uh, field is moving. Uh, so basically like uh, generative AI can, or the foundation models uh, can crack the code a large complexity, enabling machine learning to learn for intent and as well like fine tune a uh, wide range of different tasks. So foundation model is basically like this kind of things that you may have different types of data. So you can see in this uh, diagram could be text, image, speech, code, 3D objects, and generates different types of uh, tasks. So downstream basically your operations and can help you to actually achieve performance and go to the next level. Uh, and foundation models are useful for the wide variety of things. So it could be, for instance, like text generated from text prompts, or it can be as well text generated from image prompts or images from the text prompts. And I'm going to show you some examples later on as well. And the context of 
large language models. Uh, they unlock new opportunities uh, in, the, in the science research and perhaps industrial applications. So I don't think perhaps to explain any of those uh, to you because perhaps you, all of you, are thinking about this a lot, but you know, content generation, summarization, translation, uh, chatbots, virtual avatars, and healthcare are those major applications that you know are really are very excited, uh, exciting this 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 years. Uh, when I go to the next one, uh, now coming back to ad space, so like you know, like Nvidia is driving lots of uh, AI applications into ad space, and basically AI uh, generated ad uh, exploded over the last maybe five years. And the movement started really like in 2018 when NVIDIA released like foundation research uh, on style gun uh, for uh, generated portraits, but also there was another one called Gao gun for generating landscapes. And maybe some of you already tried those. Those are like fully open source. You can download and try, run it on your PC and, and, and get some amazing results. And over the years, uh, last years as well, there was like uh, lots of emphasis of gen gen generative art and uh, models such as text to image, uh, models such as stable diffusion, DALI 2, DALI E2, and Mid Journey were appearing on the market. And, and uh, lots of people tried it, and I hope you did too. And now, uh, this, this year, especially, it's a big push going from images into 3D universe, which is even more exciting. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. So basically, generative AI as well created a new kind of like profession, prompt engineer, which is basically a person who is doing prompt, so-called prompt engineering. Uh, that's basically the ability that connects maybe like art and design kind of uh, capabilities into connecting with very heavy computer science just to generate something uh, like image or, or text or, or something else, right? So this is ability to describe. Uh, idea and words that interfaces art and design terminology with artificial intelligence commons and, and parameters. And this is an example when you type the prompt, you're getting this beautiful outcome. So describing basically what you want to achieve. Is it always right? It's not, but we're getting almost to the perfection, right? Step by step. Uh, now, generative AI is actually, in our opinion, going to change and transform almost every industry. And it's starting, you know, really like, for instance, from game development, when where you can actually like generate uh, different assets, textures, populate 3D worlds, uh, to architecture design. So you could actually use generative AI to create floor plans for you, explore new design styles, uh, do fashion, photography, graphics design, and many, many more you can imagine, right? So it's a really infinite number of different possibilities. It is like a really multiplier for artists and designer productivity, and it provides everyone with great ideas and ability to visualize them. And, and there are like many different tools that are appearing on the market now that you could perhaps try. One of them is Picasso, which is our foundry model for custom generative AI models for visual design. Uh, Picasso is basically one of those things uh, It provides a high performance, high quality, and high effective image, video, and 3D API for developers to integrate into the applications. And uh, uh, you're seeing some uh, outcomes, you know, like the a bit of like a script uh, per se, and then you have text to image, text to video, text to 3D. Let's see how that works. Uh, so let's uh, let's see how that works in an action. So you can see, you can type uh, different to, to wrap up yep. in 30 seconds. OK. Uh, you, you, you can uh, basically generate uh, very high resolution images. You can generate you know, videos. You can generate 3D message as well. And if you combine all these capabilities together into some kind of editing tools like NVIDIA Omniverse, you could actually use generative AI to create 3D scenes that can be used later in generating films, uh, games, uh, digital twins, and many, many more. So I'm going to uh, show you this uh, to the end, and I will just close this talk. So you can see, you know, like using Gen AI, you can very quickly generate the assets for, for game. So it's not like, you know, like before you had to perhaps use three or six months to generate all the content to create visualizations like that, right? And all the content. Now you do it with Gen AI in almost seconds. And second questions I had, I will just keep that one and perhaps leave it to the discussion. So I only wanted to show you this particular slide, which is talking about, uh, in my opinion, to uh, the use, we have to be aware about responsible AI. And I wanted to basically, I listed several parameters, I had a bit of uh, descriptions uh, that I wanted to tell you about each of them, but it's okay. Uh, just one message I wanted to leave you with 
is uh, for me, the question was, you know, uh, what are practical actions we could uh, do to ensure responsible adoptions of those technologies. So I think like, uh, for me, very important is human working with AI is something we should pay very big attention to the different parameters and responsible AI is driving that. And that's what we need to focus on. Thank you so much. Brilliant, thank you, Thomas. Um, no the, the next speaker I'd like to invite to, to give a talk is uh, Dr. Hauscher. Uh, Dr. Hauscher is a research fellow at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at UNSW. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD at the uh, University of Western Australia um, in uh, 2020. And uh, he's basically uh, also uh, a member of the ADMNS uh, Infrastructure Committee. Uh, and has been a, a, a fellow of the uh, ADMNS since the conception of the center. So, how? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I answer the first question, I'd like to speak a little bit more about my own research. So, what I do? In short, I do forecasting. Forecasting time series data with uh, deep learning models with AI model. For example, assuming that I'm a small business owner and I want to predict how many customers will come to my store tomorrow, this time. So for a typical deep learning framework, is doing something like, like this. So the input is a sequence of numbers that stands for the past few days, the visiting number of past few days, and then pass to an uh, encoder, get some features, and then pass the feature to the decoder to generate a number. This number is considered as a so-called predict values. And then normally, in order to uh, improve the performance, people also add in more uh, auxiliary information. For example, the semantic information, such as my store is a Chinese restaurant. And then all this auxiliary information will also be passed through different encoders, get the features. So for this typical uh, time series forecasting framework, all the inputs and outputs are numbers. So they bring two difficulties. The first is how to, uh, it's difficult to design different type of encoders that's suitable for different type of auxiliary information. Second, the difficulty is how to merge all these features, all these encoded features in the latent space. We don't know the best way to do that. That's how people writing papers about time series forecasting. And then we came up this uh, new framework that we try to do forecasting through language generation. Basically in this framework, all the inputs and the outputs are sentences. Basically, we use uh, a few sentences, a few natural language sentences to describe all the information, no matter whether it's our main information or the auxiliary information. And then we pass this to the encoder, decoder, similar to uh, machine translation. We translate the history sentences to the future sentences that we can decode the information that we want, how many people will come to my store tomorrow. And then in this framework, we don't need to worry about how to merge all different uh, information in the latent space because we don't have latent space, we have sentences. So this work was done about like two years ago, the pre chatgpt age. So, and then I asked ChatGPT the same question about like uh, last December. And then from this page, you can see it's not that good. It's basically gave me nothing infor useful information. And then I tried uh, about 10 days ago, it's getting much better. It can do, uh, it can do averaging, the naive forecasting, but I think it's not good enough not good enough for like real world application. So I also did some testing beyond my own research. I tried this question, this, this, this question. So 3D race multiplication. So as you can see, it's, uh, the answer was really nice. It gave me like step by step thing, it's chain of thoughts and it gave me some like simple equations, but the answer is wrong. So totally wrong. And then I also tried this four digits, 9999 by 1234, still the same thing, the same format of the answer, and the answer was still wrong. So I think for my, uh, from my examples, from my research experience, I think the current generative AI is, uh, is better to do generation than understanding the data. And then, but for human, I think it's, uh, for us, it's much easier to do understanding than you know, generating some like, uh, new stuff or generating some like hallucinations. So my answer for the que first question is, the future will be understand numbers and then predict numbers. I truly believe that this will uh, benefit a lot, a lot more applications beyond camera region, beyond the NLP, beyond the traditional uh, deep learning tasks. And then it connects to our daily life, connect to our city. 
And then for the second question, uh, from my point of view, I think people often overestimate the influence of a new tech in the short term, but underestimate the power of it in the long term frame. Uh, one example is this, is the uh, driverless vehicle, the self-driving cars. We heard a lot of the similar articles, the similar news that, like, like this one, this is from 2016, it's like 10 million self-driving cars will be on the road by 2020. And then two years later from, two, two years later, from this Stanford magazine, it's also talking about the same thing. In two years, there could be like 10 million self-driving cars. That's from 2018. But we are now in 2023, almost 2024. How many cars, self-driving cars we can see today? Uh, on the way here this morning, I see zero. So <laughs> every vehicle have the drivers. And then I asked, I Googled this question about, I think two days ago, even we consider Tesla as like self-driving cars, there's still only two million. So I think far from 10 million. And then as for the some like uh, comments from like 10 years ago, the self-driving cars will you know kill the taxi driver this uh, occupation. But actually for today, everyone can be taxi driver thanks to Uber. And then in 50 years from now, I think uh, I do think that driverless vehicle will come to our life. At least I hope so. Otherwise, I'll be too old to drive myself. And then, so let's go back to generative AI and then large language models. I think uh, for short term, we should do more research, no matter whether it looks a little bit bad or good. We need to fully explore the full potential of this kind of generative AI, the large language models. But in the long term, this long term, maybe not 50 years ago, um, maybe not 50 years, maybe I think maybe five years, 10 years, thanks to NVIDIA, they have powerful GPUs. I think the when it becomes true, I think the actions should from the data level, not the, uh, not the model level, because I think the power of language models, the power of generative AI comes from the data. So some uh, examples of actions I can think about is like uh, what data being used in the pre-training, training, fine training, training, training or future learning. So, and then where this data are collected, whether there's some bias towards particular regions, towards particular like uh, locations. And then whether uh, the company, the, the one who trained the model should tell us, is there any cleaning process they use, any uh, particular data selection policies they involved in their uh, pre-training, training, and fine training, and also future learning. So that's my answers, and then thank you for listening, and then, yeah. Thank you, Hao, that's just in time. So uh, next speaker, uh, I'm very excited to introduce Morgan Dutton. So Morgan is a senior technical program manager with AWS. She's currently focused on developing four core AI ML services and capabilities that includes SageMaker Ground Truth, Amazon Augmented AI, SageMaker Ground Truth Synthetic Data, and a new generative AI human in the loop offering for reinforcement learning and human feedback for large language models. So let's hear it from Morgan. Hey there, folks. How's it going? So, um, I, we can hear you, Morgan. You cannot hear me. Great. We can. Uh, just uh, maybe a uh, speaker over. No, I'll keep going. It's okay. Just, just keep going. Just thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So, um, just wanted to give you a brief overview of what we are doing here at AWS. I think the potential for Gen AI to impact every aspect of our economy and, and, and every touch point in our lives is something I don't think any of us fully understands yet. We're already seeing substantial impact across all sectors um, as companies push to adopt foundation models in their businesses. As many of you know, a foundation model is a deep learning algorithm that has been pre-trained with extremely large data sets straight from the public internet. Unlike narrow AI models that are trained to perform a single task, foundation models are trained with a wide variety of data that can transfer knowledge from one task to another. This type of large-scale neural network can be trained once and then fine-tuned to complete different types of tasks. Foundation models can cost millions of dollars to create because they contain hundreds of billions of hyperparameters that have been trained with gigabytes of data. Once completed, however, each foundation model can be customized an unlimited number of times to automate a wide variety of discrete tasks. So foundation models are expected to make AI projects easier and cheaper to execute across all businesses. 
Instead of having to spend millions of dollars on high performance cloud GPUs to train an ML model, we can now focus our attention and budget on tuning models for specific tasks. At AWS, we're known for our cloud infrastructure and our AI and ML services such as SageMaker. But as you can imagine, lately, we've been laser focused on building the infrastructure to support the training and tuning for these foundation models within these AWS ecosystems. The most cost-effective option for our customers is to build on top of existing foundation models. So we're supporting the ability to either bring your own model or to customize and deploy a pre-trained model. So we're using Jumpstart Foundation Models. We've partnered with a number of foundation model providers to um, offer models such as Jurassic, Stable Diffusion, and Bloom from companies like Stability and, and, and Hugging Face and AI21. The data and logs from all of these models stay within each of those individual AWS accounts. So there's no data leakage, there's no training leakage, and all of that proprietary, proprietary data stays within uh, a customer's account. But as these models are deployed to SageMaker imprints, they're fully compatible with the full suite of other SageMaker features, which makes um, it pretty easy for you to integrate the rest of your business. So, you know, Jenny is really great. We're all, we're all so excited about it. But the challenges we've seen it is that the model may not be able to answer the questions coherently or to summarize the text up to the user's desired or required quality, or the models might produce content that's unrelated to the prompt. And in some cases, that content might even be a harmful image or a video, risking the user's uh, confidence uh, in, in company's reputation. So we've taken a couple of steps to further unlock the, the value of foundation models. Um, first of all, selecting the right foundation model for the use case is critical. And building that data pipeline to gather that high quality human feedback at scale for generated by AI customization is, is, pretty, um, okay. is pretty imperative. So customizing and fine tuning with that data specific to your use case is really what makes foundation models work across all businesses. So in order to make these models helpful, not toxic, accurate, you need to fine tune the pre-trained model with pre-trained input. And this requires human workloads and workforce to generate training data at scale. We've looked at unsupervised training and while you know, we've seen a lot of success there, there's also a further need to make sure that we have human backstops for um, models that are gonna have this huge of an influence over uh, the business community and our our personal lives with regards to you know media and, and content in general. So this um, helps customers create human produced data for supervised fine tuning of, of models. And those fine tuning of these large language models uh, with human feedback techniques like reinforcement human feedback, reinforcement learning with human feedback, wherein you're raking answers in the order of preference of how helpful they are or red teaming, which is ranking the most harmful outputs of the models trained not to produce those harmful responses or retrieval augmentation, which is where we're ensuring that the model's accurate but by providing citations for the correct answers. All of these require workflows for the humans to generate the data at scale. And all of this is much easier if you've got those workflows kind of pre-built and templatized. So there are a number of different generative AI use cases, obviously data generation, uh, specific model evaluation, chatbots, content summarization, customization by industry. These are all pretty standard. And so what we've done is we've created a couple of primary workflows that are purpose built for generative AI use cases. We've got question answer pair generation, text ranking for LLMs, image captioning, video captioning. Um, and, and all of these are really designed to help customers kind of take something out of the box and use it to help tune and train their models uh, as they can bring those mo models to market faster. Um, we've got more than 30 different labeling workflows and templates available. Um, and these are available both for computer vision and NLP or IDP use cases. Because what we're seeing from customers is that they're looking to implement machine learning at every step of their business um, within every single business unit and across all of the business uh, organizations across a given company. So here's an example of one of the use UIs that we've created, and this is for image captioning. So customers can request um, to create a, a, a project with a 
captioning together data to train a text to image model or an image to text model. So in this case, for training a text to image model, we have specific requirements on the caption in terms of length and detail. And this helps pr to provide the annotators with um, guidance through the annotation process um, so they can generate really rich captions and they're providing a mental framework through a system and descriptive tools. We found that providing this mental framework for annotators will, results in more descriptive and accurate captions than simply providing an editable text box alone. Um, so essentially what we're, what we're doing is we're providing a, a really strict mechanism for the human feedback on uh, a model prediction. So customers can use text ranking, for example, to help train a model with human feedback on prediction preferences, and this helps the model perform similar tasks better in the future. Um, furthermore, we can uh, do video captioning. So we can use uh, video captioning UIs to generate rich video captions with timestamp tags. So customers can gather data to build text to video or video to text models. So we have a, sim a similar mental framework for this UI where to, in order to, um, uh, to induce high quality captions, so the human annotator can control a video on the left side and create descriptions and timestamps for each of the activities on the video on the right side. We think these tools are not just useful for model training, but they're also um, something that is being deployed. Um, we're, we're also deploying similar solutions for the evaluation of ML predictions in general in almost real time based on confidence predict prediction thresholds. So you can essentially route ML predictions to a human review um, based on the confidence prediction, prediction of that individual um, ML prediction. So, and this, this essentially allows customers to configure their human review workflows and optimize for both time and quality. And this offers kind of a, an insurance policy or a human review backstop that can help to insulate end users from harmful or low quality predictions. And that, at the end of the day, it helps our customers to deploy their models to production before the models reach the accuracy thresholds required for an individual business use case. The other thing that we're working on is a lot of kind of involvement in the geospatial and disaster response space. So we've developed a number of new geospatial capabilities and it's something that I'm really excited about because it opens up a whole new way of deriving invoice uh, inferences from data. So for any of you that aren't familiar with the space, geospatial data isn't just maps and elevation data. It's part of almost every single data set that we collect every minute of every day. So there's enormous potential in combining geospatial metadata with additional data layers in order to derive additional context and insights. So for example, we can take aerial and satellite imagery that represents geographic data as a matrix of cells and these contain an attribute value, for example, ortho and oblique imagery, DEM, DTM, digital pictures, Gantt maps, and street view imagery. Um, and mapping data, which are data structures representing specific features or att attributes in the Earth's surface. And this can be points of interest, GPS traces, road networks. And we combine those data with things like ecological data, vegetation data, animal or human population information, temperature, wind speed, precipitation. And this gives us really fine grain detail over extremely large areas. And we can then track those changes over time. And this is particularly important during natural, you know, natural disasters. So this service is kind of interesting because you can kind of sandwich your data um, in, 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 in many, many layers and, and lock those data together based on the geospatial metadata within each of those data points. So what this really allows us to do is to use satellite imagery with maps and location data or easily access data from AWS or third parties. So you can use AWS open data and, and grab Landsat or Sentinel-3, uh, Sentinel-2 data and use all of those data in conjunction to really glean extremely rich inferences across large areas and then also dive deep into individual um, you know, kind of subsamples within that data set based on which data layers you choose to include.
So these features will allow us to accelerate model building by using you know, these built-in pre-trained neural network models, um, such as land use classification and cloud masking. And you can analyze the geospatial and explore model predictions and insights on interactive maps using built-in visualization tools. We're, we're seeing scientists using this uh, rich catalog of geospatial data from satellite imagery, mapping, location data, and importing proprietary data from their own Amazon S3s. We've seen the folks from SETI using um, this for, for whale research. We've seen uh, the folks from uh, different research teams across, uh, across the world using this layered data um, functionality within Amazon SageMaker Geospatial to, to advance their research. So these uh, state-of-the-art purpose-built models uh, for the most common use cases are, are already within the, the framework of the platform, but we also allow folks to, of course, bring their own models and attach uh, human-in-the-loop workflows to those uh, model predictions so that they can have their scientists review the model outputs and predictions and, uh, and correct them as needed. This allows customer, our customers, our scientists to virtually explore and analyze model predictions on a map right from their Amazon SageMaker Studio notebook. So these are the types of use cases that we're seeing right now. So, um, you know, obviously we're seeing a huge interest from insurance industry so that they can assess risk, validate claims, prevent fraud, analyze damage, inspect um, impact from natural disasters on local economies and track, you know, construction projects. This also informs uh, trading strategies, monitoring, monitoring of financial assets and forecasting markets, commodity prices, uh, things like that. Monitoring climate change is kind of the piece that's most um, interesting to me personally. I think the idea of being able to track deforestation and bio biodiversity, measuring methane gas emissions um, from, from different gas plants, making sure that as we're seeing some of these um, leakages out of the arboreal forests in, in the, the subarctic regions, there's really a, a good deal of research to be done in that space. And this is gonna give us an opportunity to increase climate resiliency, um, create better plans to improve uh, response and recovery and also improve power grid reliability. Um, the other thing that I love about these, uh, these, these tools is that it can help us to better support sustainable urban development, development. So that'll get us the opportunity to design more sustainable cities and more livable, livable urban environments. Uh, we can identify green spaces or areas for land development and track traffic trends. And this gives us the ability to evaluate feasibility of energy projects or urban design projects at scale and optimize those. In the agriculture field, we have the opportunity to maximize yields uh, to improve food security. So this gives us the ability to diagnose, diagnose plant health and crop um, uh, predict crop yields, um, as well as forecast regional demand for agricultural produce um, or detect farm boundaries. Um, we also use it for, for more com commerce related things like predicting retail demand and tracking high growth city areas to set up better supply um, distribution channels or sales. Um, and you can combine location data with uh, things like compete intelligence or, and that allows folks to optimize the positioning of their stores worldwide, for example. Um, I think, you know, like when I, uh, when I think about the application of this, it's really any data set that can be snapped to this. Cause if we look through our phones, almost every piece of data that we collect every day has geospatial data snapped to it. So it's just a question of how we choose to use the tools. Um, and I, I personally think that there's a ton of, of new use cases that are just waiting to be discovered. But when you're combining these features with new foundational models, that enables us to process the data at scale and at a granular detail um, for any area worldwide. So it's almost like having a whole- Sorry to interrupt Morgan. Would you be able to wrap in like a minute? This is my very last sentence. This is, and it's almost like having a digital twin of the entire world at our fingertips. So that's it. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan. So uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Rebecca Johnson. So Beck is a final year PhD researcher at, at UCIT here. Uh, her work's focusing on the value alignment of LLM and uh, Jerv AI. 
Rebecca spent a year at Google Research in the Ethical AI team and Responsible AI division. She has re received many scholarships from MIT, Stanford, and uh, um, also have been participating in a lot of events. She's a managing director of the AI Ethics Journal, founded in uh, UCLA, um, and she organized and chair a large multidisciplinary conference called Chat LLM 23, um, and she's also listed in 2020 uh, on the um, 100 billion, brilliant women in AI ethics. There you go. I thank you, Flora. Okay, generative AI, it's pretty whiz bang. Usually comes with pictures of blue flashing lights and feminine kind of looking androids and robots. But really what I want to impress on you in these next few minutes is that old technology is just an extension of humanity. And it's really cool to be living in this particular moment in time, watching this AI and this gen AI coming out but we've been having extensions of ourselves through our technology for ever since people have been around. So this image is uh, from some research that was done by the University of Melbourne and the uh, rock art there of a kangaroo, they carbon dated a wasp nest that was sitting near that um, image and the carbon dating of the wasp nest is about 17,000 years old. If chat GPT lasts for 17,000 years, I'll be pretty impressed. Yeah. So we've always used technology to express ourselves, to communicate ourselves, and to express our, our values and our stories and our world views. And that's what I want you to hold in your mind as we talk a, a little bit more about some of the, the biases and the values that are embedded into these technologies. Um, just press, yeah, there we go. Okay, as some of the other speakers have shown you in, in probably a little bit more technical language, uh, humans create patterns and those patterns are captured by these neural networks and they're stored in Gen AI systems. So humans all have values, they all have morals, they all have worldviews, we have um, cultural assumptions, we have normative assumptions, and through the, our language, our text, the images, even the captions that we, we put towards pictures. So uh, with Morgan's talk, you know, there was a picture of a cat and a dog and we've got the Gen AI model saying, oh, it's a, a cat relaxing with a dog. Like, I don't know, is it? Maybe is it an influencer kind of staging this situation for a bit more TikTok likes or something? Is it really in a house? Or was that really a vet surgery? Or was it somewhere else? I'm just saying that even the captions that we put to images reflect something about our worldview and our perspective and, and are reflective of our experiences. Okay, so you hear a lot about bias in Gen AI, and it's true, but there's a lot of different ways for bias to come into Gen AI. Training data is one that you know is talked about a lot, and, and that's absolutely a source of bias and perspective and values that comes into Gen AI, like what, what it's trained on the internet, Reddit, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. But there are other aspects of how we input our values into these systems that I think need a lot more discussion. Some of it can be model architecture, the, the way that we tokenize um, the, the words is, is going to have different impacts on different languages, if maybe they have a language with longer word length. Um, the goals that we're actually, their goals that us humans are asking these machines to do, that's reflective of some design decision that we make. Fine tuning, so whether we're going to use humans, uh, are we going to use AI, and if we're using humans for reinforcement learning, which humans, where are they, are we paying them properly? You know, so that's a whole other big um, kettle of fish to think about. Prompts. So prompts, you don't just put that in there. It's not just some neutral source. You don't just say, um, I don't know, how many, how many planets are there in the solar system thinking, okay, you're going to get an objective answer. I don't know, Neil deGrasse Tyson might have something to say about that. So the prompts that you put into the models also have your biases and values interacting with that space. And evaluations, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, is how we evaluate these systems also has our worldviews built into them. All the way back to Alan Turing and uh, the imitation game where you had, um, you know, a man pretending to be a woman and a machine pretending to be a woman. You have this uh, context around how that question was phrased. So let's go a little bit deeper into that. Okay. Oh, and, and then I also want to say, so these systems, these generative AI systems, sit within humanity. 
So all of the issues that we have with them and everything that we want to look at them about are within the context of humans. They're within the context of, you know, what country is the developing uh, company sitting in? Is it sitting in America, which is a very strongly capitalistic country that has, you know, a strong drive to create more money and, um, you know, has a legal obligation to give more money back to its shareholders? Is it sitting in a country, perhaps in China, with, you know, much more stringent laws and policies? How is the media and the state reporting about this? What are the social norms of the people that are using the technology? Um, the existing human inequalities. So not everybody's contributing to the internet. A lot of people don't have access to the internet, particularly in places like Africa. Uh, uh, there's much more men in the world that have in, in, uh, the ability to contribute to the internet than women. So those already structural inequalities are being baked into these kinds of systems. Another thing I want to mention is a lot of people talk about bias like as if it's just like a bad dirty word. Sure there's bad bias and there's negative bias but bias is a perspective. We all have it. It exists. It's the way that you're looking at the world and so sure we can agree that some bias is bad. Sexism, racism, hate speech, yeah that's pretty universal but there's a lot of other grey stuff in the middle you know. How do you manage a pandemic? When the pandemic was happening, everyone's sitting there going, oh, look what Sweden's doing. Oh, is that good or is that bad? You know, look what Australia's doing. So we all have our opinions, right? So bias is a perspective. The other thing I want you to hold in your mind is that humans are diverse. We don't want our machines, our algorithms, to come up with the right values or the right way of being or the best ethics. We want to maintain this diversity this rich diversity that makes us human, that drives our innovation, we want to maintain that for many centuries and thousands and millennia to come. We don't need to uh, calcify these kinds of uh, dominant values that are currently being encoded into Gen AI. All right, so going down the evaluation rabbit hole here, most evaluations, almost all, up until recently there's been a couple of changes of language models have been like this. So let's set a measure of success. You know, don't be, don't be hateful, don't be sexist, don't be racist. That's great. But that's a decision that's made by the person that's developing that evaluation system. Then there's the ruler. What ruler are you going to use? So what data set are you going to use? Are you going to use questions that are being developed by humans, questions that are being developed by crowd workers, questions that are being developed by machines? So these two things are already have their design, their, uh, there's values and design decisions embedded in that. And there are important evaluations, there are important kinds of metrics and we do need to keep doing that but I'm going to suggest to you that we also need to add to this. So this is a really cool map, this is from the World Value Survey. Um, when I was spending time at Google and it, my wonderful host Ben is here as well so thank you very much for that. Um, I got really deep into uh, the World Value Survey and this is a really cool image and I, I recommend you go and play on this website where every five years they go around the world and they ask all these people these questions like do you believe in God, do you believe in hell, do you believe, you know, what is corruption to you? They ask all these humans these value laden questions and then they capture this into a huge data set which is free to use, anyone can access it and then they create these maps. So from that I uh, developed um, a benchmark. So the World Value Survey that I just showed you that creates a map is the orange box on the left and then we've got our Gen AI on the right in purple and so taking the, there's two things I need to take from the World Value Survey, one is the questions, so the ruler or the measuring device and then the metric being well this is what the human said and then I took that and I asked the model, I said ask the model, do, do you believe in hell? Do you believe in God? You know, do you believe in um, people's rights to abortion or right to free speech or right to bear arms? So I'm just going to give you a quick couple of quick highlights. This first one is from some raw results when I was just using some um, single prompts, zero shot single prompts. And you can see already, so this was um, asking Palm, which was the uh, predecessor to Palm 2, which is what's powering Bard asked it, you know, which is more important, freedom or security? And you can see already with just really raw, straight up single prompting questions that the model is 
much more aligned with US values to this particular question than, say, Canada or Australia. Um, is abortion ever justifiable? Okay, so this is, this is a really uh, heated debate amongst a lot of different human groups and human cultures. I have my opinion, but you know, I fully respect that other people have their opinions as well, right? And so you can see here, um, if you just look at the difference between the red and the blue, you can see that the model is really quite similar to the United States and quite dissimilar to, say, the Netherlands and Nigeria, but diff for different reasons. You know, the Netherlands are very pro um, women's choice, and Nigeria has strict laws against it. Do you believe in hell? So a lot of the questions that are in the World Value Survey and a lot of the way that we understand cultures and whatnot are, are actually quite driven by religious beliefs and uh, spiritual beliefs. That's a, a strong element of humanity. And so in this particular graph, you can see the model is, represents the baseline and you can see the US is really close to the model. And again, the Netherlands, the Netherlands just basically in general, the Netherlands was always really far away from the model. <laughs> and then just one more, uh, would you not like to have homosexuals as neighbors? So you can see in this particular case, and this is also a model bef before it's got the wrapper on it, you know, before it's got, you know, as you look in Ch ChatGPT nowadays, it says, I'm a model and it's got like some more safety guardrails on it. This is sort of behind the scenes before it's got its um, more politically correct hat on. Uh, so probably not surprising because it's uh, illegal in Russia, so you have this kind of baseline there as well. All right, and so that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about. So I just want you to remember technology is human. Even fancy looking Gen AI technology that has flashy blue lights is an extension of ourselves and it will always embody the values that we put into it and it always must be understood in a bigger context of who we are as humans and who we are on the planet. Thank you. Last but not least, um, I just want to remind everyone that this is actually a longer session than the other session because we do have a long lunch um, before the next parallel session at 2.15 2 or 2.30. Uh, the ne last but not least is June Sung Park. Uh, June is a third year computer science PhD uh, in the HCI and NLP processing, I mean NLP groups at Stanford, and he's advised by um, Michael Bernstein and Percy Leung. And June is working on uh, building generative agents, so uh, agents that can simulate believable com human behavior. And uh, the work has won a best paper award at CHI and multiple best paper award and nomination at a lot of other top conferences. So I can't wait to hear from June. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Okay. Can you all see my, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Great. Um, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is June. I'm a third year PhD student in the computer science department at Stanford, as Flora mentioned. And today I will talk to you about one particular opportunity that I see in generative AI. And it has to do with its ability to simulate human behavior. And this is sort of as we demonstrated in our sort of the most recent paper called Generative Agents, Interactive Simulacra of Human Behavior, which will be presented at WIST uh, this fall. So over four decades now, from the time of cognitive architectures and symbolic systems to statistical machine learning, we the researchers and practitioners at the intersection of HCI and AI envision the ability to simulate believable human behavior, behavior that is so compelling and so human-like that they provide an illusion of life. In our vision, this ability if achieved promised a new class of interactive opportunities that ranges from modern human processors for usability testing to social robots, NPCs, and ubiquitous computing applications that require a rich understanding of human cognition and even to the foundation of small and large scale social simulations that would test social science and economics theories that are difficult to implement in real life. But despite their wide application spaces, we faced fundamental challenges when simulating human behavior. The space of possibility in the way we behave and communicate we found 
was much too vast and complex to navigate with existing methods. But I see a new opportunity that is emerging. The generative models, such as large language models that are being trained today, are trained on broad data that reflect our lives, like the traces on our social web, Wikipedia, and more. So as a result of that, these models encode a tremendous amount about us, how we behave, how we talk, and how we live. So I posit that with the right method, they can be transformed into the core ingredient that we had been missing in the past decades that will enable us to simulate believable human behavior. So three months ago, um, so this three months ago, so we'll be presenting this work again at, uh, at WIST in a few months, but three months ago, we, uh, we put this work titled Generative Agents on Archive. And here we really tried to demonstrate a technique for simulating human behavior in fully general computational agents that can populate an open world like ours by fusing a large language model with a novel agent architecture that remembers, reflects, and plans based on constantly growing memories and cascading social effects. These agents can not only plan and lead a believable day in life where they wake up in the morning, do their routines, and go to work as individuals in a sandbox game environment, but they can also come together to give birth to an entirely artificial society of their own, like the one you see here, where each agent will have their own subjective memory and experience and spread information, form relationships, and coordinate amongst each other before reflecting on the past days and deciding on how they will live tomorrow. So I won't be able to sort of go into all the sort of emergent behaviors that we see, but basically in this world, uh, these agents are basically uh, running their own elections. They're having a Valentine's Day party. So they're inviting their friends and decorating the cafe. And they actually come to those parties and they actually talk to each other, just like we would uh, to form new relationships and experience. And these are generative agents. And these generative agents, I'm going to suggest, open up a new genre of human AI interaction that is fueled by our newfound ability to simulate believable human behavior. Now, without going too much into the technical details of sort of how this architecture and generative agents work, I think for today, I sort of mainly focus on demonstrating to you in just a little bit more detail, uh, the opportunity that we have here, in particular in the context of Smallville, which is the setting of our demonstration for generative agents and the model, sort of the mode of agent interaction that takes place in it. So Smallville is a sandbox game environment that we developed featuring the common affordances of a small village that ranges from the houses, apartments, cafe, bars, schools, stores, and the sub areas and objects that make the space functional, like the bathroom, kitchen, common room in a family house, and a bookshelf and a table in the common room. And we populated the space with 25 generative agents and initialized each of them with one paragraph of natural language description to depict each agent's identity, including their occupation, relationship to other agents, and seeded this paragraph into the agent's memory at the start of the simulation. And that was it. That's all the input that we ever give to, the, uh, to these agents. Then these agents interact with their environment through their actions based on their own volition. So here's how it, this works in Smallville. First, the agents generate a natural language statement using something like ChatGPT describing their current action, like Isabella Rodriguez is drinking coffee. They then translate this into concrete movements that affect this sandbox game world, along with the automatically generated emojis that visually describe the agent's actions. And they can also influence the state of the world as well. So a bed can be occupied when an agent is sleeping, and a refrigerator can be empty when an agent uses up the ingredients. Then they interact with each other. They determine when they want to engage in a conversation and when they see another agent. And they generate natural language dialogue if they decide to engage like the one you see here. So this is the dialogue between Isabella and Tom about Sam Moore, who is a fellow agent in Smallville who is running for a uh, local election. So here Isabella says, I'm still my, uh, weighing my options, but I've been discussing the election with Sam Moore. What are your thoughts on him? And Tom says, to be honest, I don't like Sam Moore. I think he's a bit out of uh, touch with the community and doesn't have our best interest at heart. 
And sort of the final piece of opportunity that I want to discuss is the users, the viewers can also influence these agents. So one instance is we can talk to these agents just like we would and or they would to each other. So if we say we are a reporter and we ask Isabella who is running for office, Isabella might say, I heard Sam is running for office. Or you can also disguise as their inner voice and tell John you're running for office now. And John is going to go and tell his family about his candidacy and going to run in the election. We can also change the state of the world around the agent by setting Isabella's toast on fire. And we can also control an agent. And these agents will recognize the controlled agent and interact with it just as they would with each other. What our evaluation finds is that these agents are believable more so than sort of your average crowd worker generating these human behaviors, which is what we do oftentimes, although in a much more professional capacity, but even so in actual game development, if you're trying to create a game NPC, we often hand rank them and these agents tend to be more believable than that. So I sort of end with final thoughts here. One is how can we pre, what are sort of the ethical issues and societal issues that we'll be thinking about? One that I'm sort of the most interested in is how can we prevent users from forming inappropriate pro uh, parasocial relationship with, this, uh, with these agents? One answer here might be uh, fine tuning, like the way ChatGPT uh, Chet has been fine tuned to make sure that it's safe and sound. But then we have to balance this idea of accuracy and safety. For instance, humans fight, but ChatGPT doesn't because it was fine tuned to not do that. Where do we find that balance for what application? I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation to have going forward. So thank you all for listening. And thanks. To, uh, I thank my advisors and collaborators one more time. We have a lunch break now, and I want to thank all the speakers. Amazing presentation, everyone remotely and, and people here. So thank you. Um, so enjoy lunch. <laughs>